Good afternoon, and welcome to our first webinar in the Unleashed WD webinar series for distributors. We are committed to bringing critical and advanced thinking to distributors and their channel partners. We start today with the key to remaining relevant in the age of disruption, business model innovation. We and our partner NetSuite really think that we've hit a nerve in the industry. The turnout for today's webinar is beyond all expectations. Here's just a sampling of the forward-thinking distributors who have joined us today along with you. Look at this, from all lines of trade and geography across North America and Europe. The need to explore transformative change certainly is on the minds of many distributors. Here are just still others that are joining us today. So, thank you. Thank you for being here, but more importantly, thank you for your desire to want to think hard about what it will take moving forward to remain relevant in the age of disruption. So why is the topic of remaining relevant and business model design so important for distributors today? The air traffic management system in this country, let's just take a look at that for a second. The air traffic management system in this country is essentially unchanged since it was installed in the 1950s. And while it operates, it's unnecessarily inefficient and a source of wasted fuel and delays. Now, in a very similar sense, the business models of many distributors has gone unchanged for decades. And while working, they too, these business models of distributors are unnecessarily inefficient and in need of an upgrade. Recently, I was interviewing the owner of a $200 million industrial distributor as we were doing research for our forthcoming NAW Institute book on innovation for distributors. And the CEO stated emphatically, and alarmingly, he said much of the industry is working off business models that are 50 years old. And you know, he's right. That's why as an industry and within our individual businesses, we must heighten the discussion regarding our business models, continually exploring if they are built for creating, delivering, and capturing value in the age of disruption. Well, I think I'd better introduce myself. I am Dirk Beveridge, president of Fourth Generation Systems and the founder of Unleash WD. I'll be moderating today and hopefully facilitating some of the question and answers at the end of the session. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists today, we'll be sure to get to those. You can type in your questions in the question box on your panel and feel free to type them in and we'll get to them. So very recently, our sponsor, NetSuite, published a very insightful white paper on the outlook of wholesale distribution in 2013. Now, if you haven't downloaded this paper, it's a must read. If you want us to send you a copy of us, send a copy of it, send us an email, let us know in the chat box that you'd like a copy, we'll be sure to send it out. It really is a must read for you. Now, one of the key findings in this NetSuite research is that there are three top business priorities for distributors. Number one, revenue growth. Two, increasing profitability and three, customer retention. So I'll ask you, are any of these three priorities on your minds? I bet they are. So what do distributors traditionally, what do distributors historically do to impact these priorities? Well, what we find is that our research shows is that traditionally we focus on tweaks, looking for incremental improvements, improvements that can gain us a percent or two in efficiency. So we look at our operations, looking at inputs and outputs to find what else we can squeeze out of operations. Or we look at the sales process to look for incremental improvements to gain a bit more wallet share from current customers. And in the end, we look to develop a critical path of tactics that says what we can do today incrementally to impact revenue growth, profitability, and customer retention. Now, all, all of these are important. And as I continue to walk to talk with the C-suite of distributors, like those on our Unleashed WD advisory board, what I hear them saying is that these tweaks and incremental improvements, while we all need a segment of our leadership within our distribution companies focus on these, the CEOs are concluding additionally that we're not thinking critically enough about the business. And in fact, we are simply recycling more of the same. They also show some concern that as we look at our business models, that we're not learning and changing as fast 
as the world is changing. And the world is changing fast, isn't it? Structural changes, fundamental shifts in the economy are happening right now that every business must be aware of and must think hard and figure out what these mean to their business model. Not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but for the future as well. I mean, Inferential Focus out of New York calls it the big shift. Steve Denning wrote in Forbes just yesterday. If you haven't read this article, get to it after the webinar. He, he wrote about what he calls the three-speed economy. Deloitte publishes their shift index. Thomas Friedman continues to remind us that average is over. What they are saying and what others are saying is that we, leaders of our distribution businesses, must not accept our current business models. And we must lean forward in determining what this big shift means to how we will create, deliver, and capture value, understanding that these fundamental shifts are happening right now. Just last week, one distribution, <coughs> owner, po one distribution owner posed a cutting question with me and 12 other CEOs around the table when he asked, with the disruptive and constant pressure from all directions, how do we create a sustainable and relevant business? And I suspect that this is on the minds of a lot of you that are joining us today. And that does bring us to today, to the 60 minutes we have together. Today, we'll explore how do we start figuring out what business model will deliver on those priorities from the NetSuite research, revenue growth, income, increase in profitability, customer retention. But as I get ready to turn this over to our panel members, I'll just remind you that today is not about tweaks or our current processes looking for more efficiency. For today, we can find a little bit of inspiration from the late Steve Jobs who said, I have great respect for incremental improvements and I've done that sort of thing in my life, but I've always been attracted to more revolutionary changes. And I believe by the very nature of you being with us today, you too have that mindset that says, it's time to innovate. Stealing from Apple that it's time to think different. And IBM, IBM Research recently reported that what they're finding is that business leaders more and more are realizing that they need to continuously transform their customer experience in order to be relevant and competitive. Okay, to lead us on this remaining relevant in the age of disruption journey, we have three exciting panel members. First is Saul Kaplan, the founder of the Business Innovation Factory. Second, we'll bring in Charles Brunson, the chief bean counter and the CEO of the distributor Capital Coffee Systems. And third is Ranga Bodala, who's the director of industry marketing at NetSuite. So a foundational aspect of what we believe at Unleash is what we call lift and shift. We believe that for too long, we in distribution have not looked outside the industry for inspiration and next practices. We believe it's imperative we do a better job of exposing ourselves to the thought from outside the industry and then lifting and shifting them, modifying them as needed, into our businesses. And in that spirit, I'd like to introduce our first panel member, our first unconventional resource to help advance our thinking, Saul Kaplan. Saul is the chief catalyst and the founder of the Business Innovation Factory in Providence, Rhode Island. Saul and his team of innovators at BIF think about innovation and business model design 24-7. I mean, they eat it up. They set up real-world laboratories to experiment business models for some of the most toughest challenges like healthcare, education, energy, and entrepreneurship. Each September, Saul has a phenomenal two-day innovation summit in Providence, Rhode Island, and he's, author. he's also the author of the best-selling book, the Business Model Innovation Factory. You can get a copy of this on Amazon today, and I highly recommend that you do it. Saul is also kind enough to be a presenter at our Unleash Innovation Summit for distributors both last year. And Saul, thanks for coming back again this October 29th and 30th in Chicago. So let me turn this over to Saul. And Saul, you don't need to worry. Your Red Sox aren't scheduled to get underway for another four hours. And I know you're a self-proclaimed innovation junkie. Saul, thanks for being here, bud. Hey Dirk, uh, it's fantastic uh, to see to to be with you today. Yeah. Don't jinx my Red Sox now. Yeah, you know, they're <laughs> off to they're off to a good start. <laughs> please, don't, <laughs> please don't do that. 
coming from cubby land man we have to I know. i'm rooting for you man all right <laughs> i know i know I, so i'm thrilled to be here with you today and with this group uh i'm um i'm inspired by what you're doing i'm happy to support it i mean you're taking uh, a lot of the ideas uh, that we've been talking about here at the business innovation factory you know this notion that tweaks are not good enough that we have to create a better future and and that's going to take transformation, and we don't know how to do that. So I'm an I'm just an innovation junkie, as you said. You know, I eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. And I, I think the good news, you know, because I suspect there's a lot of innovation junkies on this call. The good news is that this is our day. You know, this is the time when people want to hear from innovators. They're interested in bold, fresh thinking, right? During tough economic times is when innovators get a hearing. That's the good news. The bad news is that we've turned it into a buzzword, right? Innovation is the word of the day. You know, everybody's using it. Everyone is co-opting it. You know, everybody's an innovator and everything's an innovation, right? And of course, when that happens, you know, no one's an innovator and nothing's an innovation. So we have to get below those buzzwords. So let me start uh, by sharing some simple definitions right, around innovation and business model innovation. Because I find if I ask you know, 10 people, I get 10 different definitions. A lot of people, when they hear the word innovation, still think invention. Yeah. And to me, these are both important and there is overlap, but they are different, right? And we love invention. We love creating new technology. We love creating new products that we can commercialize through our existing business models. And these are great things. I love that we have a culture of invention, you know, in this country. The problem is we have more technology available to us than we humans know how to absorb and use. We're not focused enough on innovation. And to me, innovation is, is very simple. It's a better way to deliver value. Innovation is a better way to deliver value. And I like that you've underlined the word deliver on this slide. Yeah. It's not an innovation until it actually solves a problem and works in the real world. It's not an innovation if you're sitting in a conference room at your company, you know, talking about something that's possible. You know, it's not an innovation if you've, you know, created a concept in a conference room or in a lab. It becomes an innovation when it collides with customer contact, right? And yeah. it determines whether it can deliver value or not. And when it does, you know, then it's delivering a better way, a better way. It's really important to distinguish those two. Too many leaders that I talk with, right, conflate those two words. You know, and when they say they want innovation, what many of them really want is a better mousetrap, a better product, a new service, you know, that they can offer. And I have nothing against those things. Those are great. We should continue to do it. But I think the imperative in the 21st century is to learn how to you know, design and test entirely new business models, right? To uh, avoid, you know, what I call being Netflixed. And yeah. I'll share the story here in a second about Blockbuster and Netflix. Yeah. On the next slide, uh, Dirk, uh, yeah. I distinguish between uh, share taking and market making. And to me, this is where our innovation conversation needs to go, right? We know how to do share taking. You know, we know how to tweak what we already do in order to do a little bit better, as you said in the intro, you know, to create one more share point or to protect our existing market share. The yeah. world is made up of share takers, right? These are people in organizations that, that have a well-defined marketplace. They, you know, they think they know who their competitors are, and it's all about the fight for a share point yeah. amongst those competitors, right? The problem is we don't have enough market makers. Yeah. Market makers are different than share takers. Market makers create their own markets, right? They are leading the markets that they're creating and growing. They're not thinking about taking one share point from a competitor. I mean, you showed a picture of Steve Jobs. Thank you yeah. for that. You know, yeah. it's always great to have a, a slide of Steve Jobs put up right before you're about to talk. <laughs> but, but I, had, is, I had one of you too, Saul. 
I have one of you too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but he is, you know, Dirk, he, I mean, he is the poster child for business model innovation. Mm -hmm. He's the classic market maker. He didn't settle for how do we compete in an existing market. He wasn't going after the MP3 market. He was go trying to create an entire new market for how we enjoy and access music. And the reason that Apple was able to do what it, what it did was it didn't think like a share taker. It thought like a market maker, and it created a brand new market, and it left the competition in the dust. I mean, just think about Sony, right back when you know, before Steve Jobs you know, came into the you know, to the music business. Sony had all the assets. They had a, a great technology division. You know, they hell, they invented the Walkman for heaven's sakes. I'm old. Yeah. I had one of those. Right? You know, they were the first ones out there. They, it was great technology. They also had a division that had contracts with most of the world's you know great music talent. Right? So they had all the parts. They should have reinvented the way we enjoy music. The problem was they were so stuck in their current business model that they did not have the capacity for experimenting with a new one. They were not capable of doing what I call R&D for new business models. And I think that's the new imperative. You have to do R&D for products and technology, but you also have to do R&D for the next business model or else you're going to have happen what happened to Sony, right? Someone like Apple is going to come along, think completely different about the marketplace, create an entire new market, and you're going to be pedaling the bicycle of your current business model so hard, you know, that you're never going to be able to keep up. I mean, Sony has been in a world of hurt, you know, ever since you know exactly. Steve Jobs first came in. You know, to that to that market. So we need to be more market makers. We need to go. If you if you go to the next slide. Hey, hey Saul, can I ask a yep. quick question? Sure. Of course so, you can. so Saul, what what why why did Sony you, you know um, get entrenched so entrenched in the current yep. business model that as you said they they had the technology they had the yep. people but they got stuck. What's the lesson there? Why do companies yep. like Sony and distributors or consulting firms why do we get stuck? And, and, and refuse to be able to look at, you know, the other alternatives that are available to us. Yep. Well, I think the, the most important reason is that we're so busy pedaling the bicycle of our current business model that we don't have enough capacity for experimenting with a new one. We do a lot of things. Go to the next slide and I'll, yep. I'll, I'll answer your question from yeah. that. Right. We do a lot of things. You know, sometimes I call it death by a thousand initiatives, you know, because a lot of large companies I visit have a ton of projects going on, you know, trying to improve the performance of the organization. You know, on this chart here, if you go up the Y axis, you know, that's the typical, let's come up with a, a better mousetrap, right, create a better product. You know, on the X axis, you know, let's improve our capabilities, you know, the way we, you know, manufacture them, the way we distribute them, you know, let's strengthen our capabilities. All of these are important, right? We can make lots of incremental changes to our product portfolio and our capability suite. That may improve the performance of the current business model, but it will not prevent you from being disrupted. It, it, the only way to, to avoid being disrupted is in addition to doing the R&D necessary to fuel the current business model, you also create a platform and the environment. I call it a sandbox. In my book, I call it the business model innovation factory. Yeah. It's a sandbox to be able to play with entirely new business models, entire new paradigms, even those, and this is the hard part, even those that might disrupt the way the current business works. You have to do both as a leader in the 21st century. Strengthen the core and experiment with the next potential business model because if you don't, these business models don't last as long as they used to and you're more and more vulnerable to being disrupted. So on the next slide, I give a simple definition for what a business model is. Right. Yep. I think a business model is the story of how you create, deliver, and capture value. The business model is the story of how an organization creates, delivers, and captures value. And when I talk with executives about this, most of them you know, aren't able to articulate 
you know, crisply what their business model is. And there's a reason for that. It's because in the industrial era, we never changed our business model. Therefore, we never had to talk about it. We didn't have to. It was, it was implicit. They yeah. didn't change. You, you worked your entire career with a single business model. Your entire mm -hmm. leadership tenure was about improvements in the existing model. You, and you just handed that model down to the next generation of leadership coming in. Well, that worked fine in the 20th century. That doesn't work in the 21st century because these business models are vulnerable. They don't last as long. I think the leader of today and tomorrow will have to reinvent their business model two and three times over the course of his or her career. And they don't teach you how to do that in business school. No. Your colleagues and peers, you know, haven't had to do that. So what I lay out, you know, in the book and the work that we do uh, here at BIF is all about how do we enable leaders to design and test entire new business models and to experiment with them in the real world. R&D for new business models, I think, is the new imperative. Let me, I, I, I'll tell the story about Blockbuster and Netflix to kind of drive the point home. Please, yeah. And then... And then I'll spend just a couple of minutes, you know, talking about you know some of the implementation steps in awesome. organizing around this uh, objective. Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. Well done. Yep. Okay, so um, uh, I can't tell uh, from participating on this webinar, but I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I'm going to ask you, you know, to imagine. You know, can you close your eyes and picture where the nearest blockbuster was? You know, everybody on this on this call. I mean, I yeah. want you to think about where that blockbuster was. Right? I mean, I can I can actually, you know, in my mind, picture the corner I used to go to, right, to yep. get a movie on the way home from work, so that we would have you know a movie to watch with the family, you know, that night. Uh, okay, so now of course the next question is, you know, how many of you can still picture that blockbuster today? Is it still there? And you know, there are a few of these things left, but there were 5,000 of them at the peak, 5,000 wow. blockbusters in the U.S. It was an awesome business model, right? They were on every corner. They made at getting access to movies really convenient uh, for so many of us, and we all remember you know, where they were. Well, what happened? The new technology that came out, you know, all of you will recall, you know, was the ability to compress a movie and put it on a DVD instead of a video cassette. And so all of a sudden, what did Blockbuster do? Blockbuster did what most companies do with new technology. They said, how can we use it to improve our current business model? And what did they do? They put the DVD on the shelf right next to the video, video. cassette. Yeah. So now you go to your corner Blockbuster and you could choose for yourself. They didn't care. You know, get a DVD, get a video cassette, right? And they thought they were improving the business, right? But what did Netflix do? A guy by the name of Reed Hastings, right, graduated from Bowdoin College uh, back here in Maine, mm. rented the movie Apollo 13, and like many of us, didn't get around to watching it until it became overdue and there was going to be a late fee at Blockbusters, and it pissed him off. Didn't set well. Liter he literally got pissed off because of a late fee on on uh, you know on that movie, and basically said, "There's got to be a better way. You know, this DVD, I don't need to go to the corner market to get that. This thing is light enough to send in the mail." And Netflix was off to the races with its uh, mail you know, d distribution model. And what do you think Blockbuster did as they as, as they started to grow? Blockbuster says that you're a niche. You know, you're a fly on the right. wall. You'll never amount to anything. We've got 5,000 locations. Yeah. Yeah, we're the, we're the gorilla. We're going to crush you. You know, and you know, you're this little startup, you know, mailing you know, DVDs to people. And, and they can get DVDs in our store anyway. And they even flew down. That Reed and his leadership team even flew to Dallas to meet with the senior executives you know, huh. at Blockbuster. You know, and said, hey, why don't we partner? You know, you can handle all the in-store distribution, and we'll be the online, you know, component, and no one will ever touch the combination. And of course, Blockbuster says, "Get out of here! You're a niche player, right?" And what does Netflix do? Ends up growing to the point where they completely disintegrate Blockbuster's 
you know, billions and billions of dollars of shareholder value you know, got wiped out because Netflix, like Sony, couldn't, the, the Blockbuster, like Sony, couldn't get out of the way of its own business model and did not have the capacity to experiment with a new one because Netflix didn't invent anything. I mean, there's no, the technology was freely available. All they did was create a different business model, a way of delivering, you know, and capturing value, you know, from the end consumer. And what I really love about the end of this story is, of course, even Netflix has to worry about being Netflix to bet, right? The point is you have to always experiment with new business models. Even when you create a new one, you better be working on the next one because, Netflix is vulnerable to being Netflix too. And of course, you know, they're doing exactly that, trying to avoid that fate. You know, the, obviously the new technology is streaming. Uh, they, you know, look pretty uh, rough for a little bit and then it's gotten better for them a little more recently, but excuse the pun, I don't think the movie is finished. And so I'll conclude the story with the notion that if you're not thinking about business model innovation as part of your innovation agenda, you are very vulnerable to being Netflixed and you need to create the environment where it is safe and there are resources and you're willing to play in that sandbox to create entirely new business models and to see what works. And you're going to have to get much more comfortable with trying things quickly in the real world to see if they work and be more comfortable with projects that don't work. I mean, we've created this whole culture uh, where nobody wants to fail anymore. Yep. And well, the culture we've created, you know, by and large, you know, ends up with nobody trying anything because they don't want to fail. You cannot be successful, you know, particularly in the transformation space or in the business model innovation space unless you're willing to try more stuff, unless you're willing to create the environment where people and resources in your organization, you know, can be deployed to try not just things that will help today's business model, but try things in a way that might change the entire way value gets created, delivered, and captured uh, with the customer. So I think, Dirk, I think I will stop there and then you know handle so, as we come back in the Q&A part you know any of the you know, sure. kind of implementation I, details that people want. So I really appreciate that. I, I will ask one quick question before we go to Charles if you don't mind. You know the, the whole thought process um, Saul in terms of the R&D for the current platform versus yeah. the R&D for the business model innovation. Yeah. From your labs, from your experiences, what holds businesses back? From, from jumping into, as you say, that sandbox? Is it, is it capacity? Is it resources? Is it leadership? Is it a decision that uh, leadership yep. has to make? Is it culture? If you've got just 30 seconds on that, what do you think yep. holds businesses back? So I think it starts with being clearer about uh, what our objectives for innovation are. It's too many people say, you know, you know we're going to be innovative. I want to create an innovation culture in my company. And they're not explicit enough about what they mean. Do you mean you know, improvements to the way the current business model works? Okay, here's how we can organize for that. Do you mean in addition to that, that you want to play with new business models, right? You have to organize that sandbox differently. They're not the same. It's much easier to select for projects that support the current operation, right? Yep. The minute you put people from the line in the position to say yay or nay to a new project, they're going to always select the project that supports the current business model. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the, the way they're incented. If you also want project work to explore entire new business models, it's going to take leadership from the top of the organization to be crystal clear about the objective, be willing to establish the resources and the sandbox for that exploration, and then be willing to play an ongoing role. I mean, too many CEOs, you know, will say the right words about innovation, but then yeah. they go back to their office and they leave line management, you know, responsible to pull it off, who are incented to improve the core. So if you really want to play in the business model innovation space, the senior leadership has to stay engaged because they're going to have to run interference because there's inevitable conflict 
right? The folks in the line, you know, they're not going to like any project that yeah. even smells like it could potentially disrupt the core or distract the core from its mission. So if you want it to, to have a dual purpose or hybrid organization that both improves the current business model and does research and development for the next one, you need to create the autonomy and the, provide the leadership cover for that to happen. Fantastic. Saul, thank you so very much. You know, you You're talk about, you talk about the importance of leadership and certainly the leadership in our individual organizations. And I got to tell you from a personal and professional level, I appreciate your leadership. You're stepping out and and screaming from the mountaintop about the importance <laughs> of of innovation and business model design and um you're you're leading the charge but and and we appreciate it very very much. Um I'd like to introduce you and everybody else to another leader who um, is, in fact, um, leading innovation and business model design, not at Netflix, not at Apple, not at Sony, but within a distributorship. And that is Charles Brunson. And Charles, thank you so much for being here. Charles is the chief bean counter. Can anybody guess what business he's in? He's the chief bean counter and CEO of Capital Coffee Systems. And um, like many of us on, on, on the call today, he's a multi-generational owner of the business. Uh, they've gone from a single location to expand it across the Carolinas. Phenomenal growth um, of over 10% without operational expenses because of the innovation that he's bringing on board. He's got the highest level of service, and he's going to talk to us uh, about that business model in the industry. And he truly is a business model innovator. And I really appreciate you joining us, Charles. I got, I guess the first well, question thank you for, for having me. Yeah. Charles, I guess the first question, what is that over your left shoulder? If you don't mind. Over my left shoulder on, on the, on the uh, picture on the wall. Yeah. The old saying, the buck stops here, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's the constant reminder for you. Is that right? I love it. It, it is one of my passions, so yes, I have to keep my back to him or uh, I'll lose, lose my train of thought. I love it. Well, Charles, uh, again, thanks for being here. I understand that you started reexamining your business model um, several years ago. Um, can you give us a, a, a brief overview as to the business conditions that might have caused uh, this new level of thinking, please? Well, um you know, everybody had the uh, the. And I, I better. I'm going to back up first and Please. say that I wasn't the original innovator. Uh, the founder uh, and my dad, who uh, started the company back in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s, um, were the original innovators by changing the way we service and go to market. Um, we have improved it. Uh, the second generation, of course, is the one uh, that brought the computers to the business, and uh, you know, technology as a a whole, um, but what really drove us, I guess, and in, in, to your question now is yeah. 2008. We we exploded just like everyone else did, and had a, a free fall off a, a major customer. And you know, uh, I think we had talked about it earlier. We didn't lose um, a lot of customers in the when the bubble burst, but because we are a tech uh, tech heavy market, we lost a lot of coffee drinkers. Huh. So we had to stare at our business and figure out how to change where we were and get back to profit and back to, uh, you know, gain back all the sales we had lost. You bet. You bet. Thank you. And, and so as you're looking at, right, the, the immediacy of, you know, getting, as you say, getting back to profits and getting back to growth. Um, I, I know that you, you, you've talked about that you wanted to figure out ways to keep up with the Amazons of the world. Is that right? I mean, you're a distributor of coffee, but you're thinking about wanting to keep up with the Amazons of the world. Is that right? Well, you know, and I don't know how many of the people listening know exactly what we are. We are an office coffee service. In mm -hmm. our industry, we're called OCS, which is just you know, the abbreviation. We're lumped in with vending, um, but Capital Coffee does no vending. We are strictly a coffee service. So what we do is we go into offices, uh, set them up with free coffee equipment, yep. and then service it and the supplies that go with it. So our industry started back in the late 60s, and you know we of course jumped on board in the set late 70s. Um, the original coffee service, a guy would pull up in his van or box truck, 
and he would have about 200 SKUs on his truck of coffee, cream, sugar, whiteners, sweeteners, the whole, uh, you know, cups and everything. Yep. And he would walk inside and wipe down your coffee brewer, uh, take an order for what you needed, walk out back out to his truck and uh, fill the order right there, you know, from a handwritten ticket or whatever. Um, and that was it. He would, would walk out the door and head to the next customer and be able to work as many customers as uh, he had enough product for. Yep. Um, what we saw with that model is he could only work enough until he ran out of coffee or ran out of stirs or whatever was on his truck. When he ran out of that first skew, he started, you know, the, the customers started not receiving product. And yep. we stared at it and said, wow, this is, you know, for lack of a better word, dumb. So we started taking our small customers and asking them if, hey, would it be all right if when I called you uh, on Monday uh, to prepare for a Wednesday delivery, if you could just look over there real quick and tell me uh, what you need for cream and sugar and coffee. And most of the people said, hey, no problem. Cool. Um, so that one, that one change right there was major for us because when our trucks would leave, they would be full of product that is already sold on a ticket to be delivered. So instead of the rolling warehouse returning back at the end of the day with, you know, a third of the stuff still on the truck, ours came back with some empty boxes and a, a hand truck yep. and, you know, pure profit. Um, that led to another innovation for us, which we call our concierge service. So, so uh, yeah, just, hey, Charles, large, Charles, just, yeah. just real quick. Sorry. So I, I love it. So what, what I, what I understand is that capital coffee system, as you looked at your business model, right? You said that we right. had to innovate. And, and one of the things, it, it, there were really three areas, I think. And one of them that you just talked about was you had to move from this rolling warehouse. And what that did was you changed that part of your business model and it allowed you to send out a full truck um, to drive sales, profitability, and customer satisfaction. Is that right? Correct. All right, cool. So that was number one. Number two, then, is, is this customer centricity that, that I think you're about to get into. And you, you had mentioned that you have this concierge service. Is, is that right? Correct, yeah. So tell us about the, this concierge uh, the, service, the, if you don't mind. The concierge service was where we took it one step further. You know, I'd said that the calling process was what we did with small customers. The larger customers that have, you know, they had several hundred employees and had multiple break rooms. The um, and I'll use the the Nortels of the world, the Cisco systems, yeah. those type of customers. We would take complete control of their break room, and yeah. we would be from. Order taking, cleaning, stocking, delivery, all the way to invoice generation. Or one of our concierge uh, attendants would do the whole process for them. So we became a hands-free service. They didn't have to touch it. And that concierge service, now the industry, everybody's chasing us and doing that. They, they've figured out that when they go in and offer that program, it really, you know, the, the, the example someone gave me was they, they had a salesman come in and say, we would really like to replace Capital Coffee. Can you tell me what they do for you? And the guy said, I have no <laughs> idea. I just know there's always coffee in my break room. Love it. And that's the beauty of, uh, you know, that that's a pat on the back to us when someone says that. You, without question, without question. So, you, you know, you're in the coffee business, but what I'm hearing is you're, you're more than that. You've built this, this model, if you will, around a value proposition that might be captured on the screen that you – that you have tailored break room service solutions, what you just talked about, in well, support. What, what, not, not being a rolling warehouse allowed us was to go from the 400 SKUs that the OCS industry yep. kind of lived around to, you know, I think today we have 3,500 SKUs because we can offer everything. And wow. all, you know, if the truck's full, we'll just have to load another truck. It's not, oh, this guy's going to be in this area and here's the 200 items he's got to stock. It allowed us to, you know, the, the first item uh, we started selling was copy paper. Yeah. Every customer we serviced uh, with coffee had copy paper, and we asked, if we gave you a fair price and delivered it, would you buy copy paper from us? And, you know, it was almost an immediate yes across the market. Hmm. So that, that's how we grew our business. And, you know, what a, what a small innovation, but, boy, it really added the uh, SKU set for us and, and made us more relevant to the customer. You know what I'm thinking about? If bought coffee and cream from you, it was easy to say, well, I just – Either 
to do coffee and cream. But if they, if you buy your coffee and cream, your toilet paper and towels, your sodas, your snacks, and your copy paper from them, it's a little harder to replace them. Yeah, no doubt about it, Charles. And I'm thinking about what we learned, one of the things we learned from Saul just a little bit ago when he said, you, you know, in, innovation is an innovation until it collides with the customer, right? And that we're driving Correct. value with that customer. And, and through that warehouse, that, you know, moving from the rolling warehouse and, and adding that concierge service, now you're colliding that innovation, that model, if you will, with the customer who is saying, yes, continue to take care of us. You're supporting our culture and you're helping uh, our company succeed um, rather than just simply delivering, as you said, coffee and cream, if I hear you right. Correct. Cool. So then, Charles, the third part of your business model, I understand, is in order to make all this happen, you need to leverage technology, if I understand it right. And you need to leverage customer-sensitive technology. Um, can you just share Correct. with us? Tell, tell well, us the story. Uh, the, OC, the OCS industry, or office coffee service industry, yep. has always been, you know, it started in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, now there are a couple of national companies that are pretty big. And, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't say they're being highly innovative, but, they, you know, they've got their systems in place. But for us as a small company, uh, to beat the other small companies around and the national guys, we had to do it faster, cheaper, better, and smarter. It is always the I don't know, the saying I've always grew up knowing. And we said we have all these people that were calling for an order. We slowly shifted them when email came out to email. And actually, before email, we used fax machines, believe it or not. Um, yep. But we would have people fax in their orders or email in their orders, which gave our order entry people twice as much time to enter orders. They didn't have to be on the phone, you know, a phone call from hello, goodbye to the number of items takes, say, five minutes. So right. a customer, you know, a customer service rep could only answer and call that many people a day. Well, if it only took them two minutes to enter the order and they could pick up 10 orders off the fax machine, you know, boom, there's your innovation. Email took it one step further. Yep. Um, and then when the web came out and web shopping became prevalent, our industry said no. None of our competition were even huh. looking at the web. They, they had these cheap static sites that you could look at, and it looked like someone held a business card up against a wall and yep. took a picture, and that was their website. And my brother and I said, you know, let's, let's be better than that. Let's use our web as, website as a marketing tool and really spent the money on it. Um, we later said, hey, we got to have a website people can place orders on and replace the email process. Yep. And we have really spent a lot of time and effort improving our website. And nice. that has been, you know, the driving factor, which I guess you're going to lead me to how we got to NetSuite. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you want to just share with that real quick, if you don't mind. So I guess it's 2013. 13. Yeah. So about 2010, we were running, I, I'll have to reel them off, we were running QuickBooks for our back office, we were running uh, Business Contact Manager for our CRM package, which was not working successfully because it didn't integrate well with our front office piece, which was a piece of software called Streamware, which we also used handheld devices, which synced up to a software device called MobileSync, and also we used Outlook uh, for our email. So. We're running wow. five or six different uh, pieces of software and trying to make them all match. And, you know, it just is a very working. slow and painstaking process. On top of that, Streamware integrated, and I'll use that term very loosely, yep. integrated with a company that uh, called OCS Access that would pull information out of our system and dump it into a website for, for our cart system. Well, that didn't work so well. Yep. <laughs> And we tried and tried and tried, but our industry just was not chasing the carts as heavily as we were. And, you know, the, the suppliers of the software said, you know, it's not a push for us to modernize yet. Um, we're working on it, but it's not, you know, at the on the front of our stage. And we're sitting here staring at Amazon going, if you're not like Amazon or like Staples, you're not going to be here in 10 years. Yep. So we went out looking for a cart. And we uh, we backed into the cart system uh, or backed in the NetSuite when we found uh, you know found them as a possible uh, e-commerce solution. 
Yep. And then stared at the whole system and said, wait a minute. We've been chasing a CRM package around. It's got it. Check. It's cloud-based, so I can. we don't have to worry about servers being in one city and employees in another and technology here. And, and I'm not a real uh, good database guy or network guy. I'm more yep. of a iPad and keyboard kind of guy. Yep. So it was a great offering for us to say, hey, we can eliminate all these problems with NetSuite. Wow. And that's where we are. <laughs> love it. Love it. You know what I, what, what I take from that, and I really appreciate that, is I love – I'm going to go back to what we talked about at Unleashed, right, that the importance of lifting and shifting. And what I think I heard you say is that, you know, as you had this vision for the business model, right, um, uh, to, to modify and innovate that, that business model – if you would have looked just at your own competitors, if you were to look just within the OCS industry, right, you would not have been able to um, uh, innovate the way you did. You, you had to look outside at, and, and hold yourself up against the Amazons and the staples of the world. And that led you to not just best practices, but next practices that would allow you to think about your di business differently, think about your business model differently so that you could differentiate yourself and create a sustainable model um, for the future. I think it's just brilliant, um, Charles. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, real quick, if you don't mind, um, you, you know, we talk about you working towards this unfair advantage at Capital Coffee Systems to be the Amazon and the Ritz-Carlton of customer experience in the break room supply industry. And you've built your business model around uh, uh, doing that, if I've heard you right. And I just think it's a phenomenal uh, standard um, to, to set yourself up, uh, up for uh, in your business and in your industry, Charles. Well, well they can buy everything I sell from Amazon. Yep. They can also buy it from Staples or from the other OCS guys. Yeah. So... If we are not out there being the best at what we can be, you know, we're just the other guy. Yeah. Um, and also our model with uh, the concierge service and inside rep and driver, we have a three or four point uh, customer centered uh, team approach where it isn't just the one guy that gets in off the truck, walks inside and services your brewer and leaves. If that guy's sick, who else knows his route or who else knows the contacts? We use three or four people to always have multiple links to a customer. That's awesome. You know, given that sense of there's a whole team of people behind you to help you. You know, you bet. That, that, that's one thing that we really think the customers like and, and enjoy with us is they might ask the driver one day for something, and the next day they'll, they'll call me. Hey, Charles, uh, you said call you anytime. And, <laughs> they you took know, you up on it. Yeah, yeah. They do. They do every day. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hey, Charles, that, oh, wonderful. Thank you for sharing the story. We could spend a heck of a lot more time uh, delving into it, and I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to uh, move to uh, Ranga in just a second here. But, Saul, I'd be interested from your perspective, right? The, the story that you heard um, Charles telling here. Um, did, did anything resonate with you relative to your belief that distributors need to be doing relative to uh, business model innovation? I'm sorry, Derek. Oh, did you? Did no problem. Did, yeah. Did, so, did you point that at me? Yeah. yeah I, no, I, um, I, I, mean, I, I was just thinking about what I was going to tweet. You caught yeah. me. Okay. Because um, I really liked what Charles said about um, uh, resiliency and multiple yep. connection points to the customer. Uh, I really like that. Uh, I think that's worth um, you know, thinking a little bit further about. I mean, too many organizations you know, have created these kind of rigid business models where you know, somebody kind of owns the customer. You know, that's my job. You bet. You know, the relationship with the customer. Instead of figuring out how you can mobilize all the capabilities in the company and capabilities outside of the company you know, in new and different ways to change the customer experience. But it absolutely takes that kind of perspective to kind of rethink the experience through the lens of the customer. So I like the idea of trying to understand the business model opportunity by understanding what's going on in the break room at companies. Yep. You know, what's the behavior there? What's going on? I mean, don't, I mean, don't think about it through the lens of your company 
at what you can do you know, with the existing capabilities you have and the way they're wired together. Think about what the customer is trying to do and ways that you could enhance that experience and then start playing with the capabilities you know, in kind of a rapid cycling experimentation way. You know, how could we reassemble the capabilities? How could we add some new capabilities that could completely change that equation? And I think the, you know, the Charles' examples uh, were good. Cool. I appreciate that, Saul. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I love what you suggest there too, and what we learned from Charles in terms of, you know, finding ways to add new capabilities and reassemble capabilities. And and quite frankly. Technology, I believe, right, if, if it's done right, is a way that we can, uh, it, it's a tool that we can utilize to help us in that adding new capabilities and reassembling our capabilities. And, and to help us think that through just a little bit is Ranga Bodla, who is the um, Director of Industry Marketing at NetSuite and our sponsor. And number one, Ranga, really appreciate you and NetSuite bringing us all together today. And I know that you, too, think 24-7 about helping distributors remain relevant uh, by becoming what you call a 21st century distributor. And, and personally and professionally in NetSuite as a whole, you know, really are enablers of innovation and success. And we'd love to hear from you some of the thoughts that you and NetSuite have that, that helps distributors become that business model innovator. Sure, Dirk. I, uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And, uh, you know, it sounds like we have a lot of great uh, folks that have joined us today. And, and uh, Charles, thanks again for, uh, for your story. It was, uh, it was great to, to hear, hear what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm always uh, constantly surprised and pleasantly surprised uh, to hear different stories of how folks have used um, the technology that NetSuite provides uh, to really change their business. Um, Dirk, if you can go to the next slide, you yep. know, the, 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 what I, I, I want to, I'm, this is a pretty complex picture, uh, but I, I really like the image and what it's trying to, to bring across. And that is this idea that, you know, the, the, the distribution landscape, you talked about Thomas Friedman, you talked about the world is flat. I mean, yep. this image is a great depiction of the reality of today's distribution landscape. I, I, I love the idea that, you know, the, the reality is if you were talking 20 years ago, you know, or even 10 years ago, right? The, the idea of operating across multiple borders, the idea of operating um, and sourcing from multiple locations, uh, yet being a small company, you know, wasn't wasn't a you know, it was a fairly novel concept. Yep. But this picture today, uh, you know, is fairly is fairly common, regardless if you're talking about a few people uh, or a global organization of thousands. I mean. Uh, you know, some some of you may be fans of uh, of the sh of the show Shark Tank as an example, um, and and I love the fact that you can, you have these guys that are entrepreneurs that come onto this show that maybe two people, but yet they're sourcing globally, they're distributing uh, you know locally, and they're they're you know they're faced obviously with a with a number of of, of challenges, um, and the reality is we hear and and talk about is almost every organization regardless of size trying to meet this challenge looking to create and expand their supplier and sales channels. Yep. They're trying to build a competitive advantage and strengthen their customer relationships. And, you know, innovation is ultimately part of that solution. Um, but if you go to the next slide, what, we, what we've seen, and, and Charles talked a little bit about this, yep. is there's real issues that are kind of get in the way of this. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear from folks is, I'd love to be able to change. I'd love to be able to improve things. However, um, right now, you know, I, I, I have very basic issues. I have, uh, you know, just inefficiencies in the way we do things. Uh, we don't have a clear view of how the business is performing. We don't have timely necessary information. And, and until we get those things under control, we can't even think about, you know, the innovation that you're talking about. And so, um, you know, as, as Charles has talked about to us before, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a size 10 business in a size 2 shoe, Yep. Uh, and they really need to get to a size 15 shoe before they can really think about that. That's the idea that we're that I think is is important to think about. I love um, it. And, and you know that's this idea that that these these issues really come into way of of, of distributors innovating. The idea of all these disconnected systems, the uh, you know the being able to connect all these pieces together and not be able to tie them together. Without question, Ranga, as I'm listening to you there, 
I'm reminded of a uh, Unleash uh, storyteller from last November, along with Saul, by the name of Ron Ashkanis, who's a senior partner at Schaefer Consulting. And he told the story of working with Jack Welsh at GE and designing their workout methodology to drive simplicity throughout their entire company. And, and, and what he reminded us, you know, to your point, is that real issues get in the way. But then everybody looks at and say, who's responsible for all those real issues getting in the way? And what he was very clear about was that, you know, we've met the enemy and he is us. That the complexity and the getting in the way begins with us. Those of us on this call, the management and the leadership of the businesses. And he said, you know, you're not, your job is not to eliminate process but it's to simplify it and to implement it and, and to get those real issues out of the way. And I love the fact that you're talking about how NetSuite can help us do that. Yeah. And we, and we've really seen that, you know, the, the, the notion of what we're delivering and that, and you know, Charles brought it up is, is the idea that, uh, you know, bringing, having one system that enables the, the, the entire business, but yep. it's, it's the notion that we're not just delivering, Technology. I mean, there's lots of folks who are delivering technology. The difference of what NetSuite is offering and the reason we've seen our customers be successful is we're allowing folks like Charles um, to focus on what he knows best, right, which is, which is coffee and understanding his customers and understanding how to, how to service that model. We focus on the technology. We focus on the, the, the boring stuff like servers and backups and making sure that the systems are, are secure and that no one's hacking oh, into them. You, you know, I mean, that's the, that's, that's not fun stuff. No one, you know, that's the stuff that we want to focus on because we we're good at it. And then allowing, you know, folks like folks like Charles and Charles is just one example, but of, of, of being able to, to um, focus on what they know best, which as I said, it's, it's about making sure that our customers are successful because if our customers are successful, they're happy. And when you ask them the question, what, is, what, is, what do they do for you? They say, you know what, I don't know. I just know that my, my, my business runs. And that's, that, is, that is truly what you want from your, uh, from your customers, right? You want them to, to feel like, you know what, I don't have to think about it. It's just, it's just there. It's just done. You bet. You bet. You bet. And did I hear a hallelujah there in the back? <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think I did from you. Charles, all right. Love it. And so if you go, uh, you know, just to, to the last two slides for me, yeah. uh, um, you know, Dirk, is, is you know, we were really about providing uh, that complete business view across the organization to, yep. to help companies streamline. And, and like you said, when they get these simplified processes, they can put them in place. But being able to get, get a, you know, anytime, anywhere access, you know, we, we first spoke, when I first spoke to Charles, he was based, um, he's based in Raleigh, North Carolina. I spoke to him and, and he was in his home office. Uh, when I talked to him the second time, he was in his uh, his professional office. Yeah. When I talked to him the third time, he was in uh, he was in w with one of his business partners, uh, I believe his brother. And I think today he's speaking out of South Carolina. And every time, it's that that idea that he you know he can access the system from anywhere he's at, be able to give give you the latest information about where the business is performing. And that's really the beauty of what uh, I think can help unleash these 21st century wholesale businesses. And that's uh, really where we, we want to go. And Ranga, truth be told, Charles did tell us that he can also do it from his deer stand um, <laughs> and access yeah. it all. He, he did. So <laughs> I think that's going to get another hallelujah from Charles. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> the so, the other know, thing I would add to this, that I, and I don't know if y'all will maybe touch on it later, is since we have come on NetSuite, we have grown, and I, I, I don't know if we've been on NetSuite two full years now, but we have, uh, we have grown 15% maybe from the maybe even 20% from the original number when we started NetSuite and have only uh, administratively added maybe one person. It, it really Amazing. has streamlined our business and taken several of the old antiquated processes and just they're gone. We don't even do those processes anymore. Fantastic. Uh, that, that's Thank you, Charles. True, you know, that and the other is when you're at a dinner party and someone says, I don't know who my coffee service is, you pull out your NetSuite app and say, you're one of mine. <laughs> love it. Love it. I love that as well. It's, uh, it's one of the things I've, I've, I've always loved it. I've been, been at NetSuite for, for almost, almost hitting on three years now. And, uh, and, and the, I, you know, someone made the comment to me that, uh, you know, I'm, 
uh, I'm ruined for for joining another company because the the beauty of w being able to operate and work anywhere you need to to so get the access to the information you need is uh, is is something that uh, I'm spoiled with now because I I literally can uh, I don't I don't I don't use NetSuite in the deer stand I uh, I have to apologize but uh, <laughs> um, the the fact that uh, you know you can be anywhere in the uh, in the U.S. or in the world quite frankly be able to access it is uh, is a huge benefit so. Um, Dirk, I think we're we're getting yeah. close to the end of the uh, top of the hour, so um, I'll uh, I'll wrap up. But if uh, I didn't know if you had any other um, closing comments you wanted to make, yeah, I will. So, Ranga, I, I really appreciate that. And guys, I know that uh, there's been some questions sent in. I know uh, Guy Blissett, you you sent one in about uh, uh, you know how, how do you structure the sandboxes and the like, and we're going to get those uh, answers to you uh, afterwards. So. Um, yeah, we are at the top of the hour. The time has gone real fast. Uh, really appreciate. I guess, you know, if I had to just say off the top of my head, you know, there's always a better way is what I'm hearing. We got to continually evolve and refine, you know, to stop ourselves from being disrupted. And Saul, you reminded us about the experimentation. So I would like to say thank you, Saul. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Ranga. Um, thank you, NetSuite, uh, for bringing us all together. Uh, we really um, appreciate you uh, advancing, bringing this uh, critical thought and advancing our thought um, as unconventional resources. So, Ranga, did you say that you had one more thing to share with us? Or nope, that's that's it. I uh, I want to thank everyone for for attending, and um, you know, if if you want to learn more, we'd be you know be glad to to speak to you more about uh, about how we think we can help you innovate. Absolutely, and we'd be happy to put everybody in touch, and uh, so. Uh, want more information from NetSuite? Let's get in touch with Ranga or ourselves. We can put you in touch. And we also hope that you'd all, uh, if you love the stories of uh, Saul, you know, our Unleashed WD Summit this October 29th and 30th. So thank you all. Uh, we've had a stimulating process, uh, thought process here. Let's go out, continue to innovate, and continue to innovate our business models.